position that I have to record some of the events in my life in order to have them posted, I guess, on the web somewhere so people can look at it and understand what I'm saying because I don't know, I guess maybe I'm not clear enough or maybe I haven't spoken blunt enough, but I can't figure it out. I just got another, oh, I don't know, discussion from someone that said, well, wait a minute, let me understand this right. Are you saying, are you actually having the audacity to say that you have heard Jesus speak to you? Yeah. Duh. I mean, come on. I wrote back, trying to be casual, I said, did you think he was kidding when he said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they will not follow the voice of another? How could you hear his voice by reading his word? I don't know about you, but I was kind of goofy when I was first saved. I thought the Bible was meant to be understood the way it's written, not converted into meaning something it's not saying. Because you see, people seem to get this idea that he doesn't mean hear him, he means read him, because faith comes by reading and reading by the word of God. I don't think so. Don't get me wrong, reading is good, but hearing is hearing. Reading is reading. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. I get the feeling that for some reason, people when they get saved, get dumb. I don't know. Maybe it's a spiritual truth and we need to change this poor spiritual laws to another spiritual law that says, as soon as someone gets saved, they disengage brain and suddenly become like a baby. They have no brains whatsoever. I don't know. No, of course not. Jesus, you know, if you if you approach the word of God, the Bible, which is common sense, logic, whatever you want to call it, just read it what it says. And then, you know, God's talking to you. You know, I mean, it's it's not like he's trying to you know deceive you. So if he says that he's going to speak to you audibly, he's going to speak to you audibly. And when he says that he'll speak to you so that you could hear him, that means audibly. Now, call me silly, but since it happened, what am I going to say? Oh, I'm sorry, Lord, but I'm going to have to deny you the privilege of sharing that with me, because unfortunately, you're not supposed to talk that way, God. You are supposed to only work in one way in that word so that we could make it theological. It's kind of like trying to tell someone that's done something that they didn't do it. It's like me saying, OK, you're left handed. No, I'm not. I'm right handed. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. You're left. No, I'm not. I'm right. No, you're left handed. No, I'm not. I'm right handed. No matter how many times you say it, I'm still going to wind up right handed. So I don't know what people were expecting or what they're thinking, or maybe I'm not making this clear on the video. But yes, Jesus has spoken to me audibly. And he even said, I am Jesus. And I'm like, I will admit this. You don't say much when you're talking to when Jesus is speaking. It's kind of like I was dumbfounded. I mean, you know, bluntly, when Jesus spoke to me, I was I was stopped in my tracks. I was trying to make it up to be, you know, somebody pulling a stunt. And I couldn't figure out how they could pull this stunt because it was absolutely miraculous. There was no way that it could have happened any other way. And so I'm listening to what is being said to me. And then Jesus said that, you know, it's him. And he says, then just like typical Jesus, or at least as far as I know him, maybe you know him different. But then he hit me right where it hurts. You know, because I've been a Christian for, you know, pretty dynamic, born again Christian, walking the spirit for a while. And he said, do you believe me? He said, this is Jesus. You know, I am. I think he said, I am Jesus. 
And he said, do you believe me? And I went, and I was stopped in my tracks. I mean, it, it felt like eternity stopped. All of a sudden, everything went out of me. From my inner soul to my inner being to the Holy Spirit inside me just felt empty inside. It was as though the Holy Spirit was gone, which makes perfect sense now that I look back. But I couldn't discern. I couldn't tell. I was like blank. And I went, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then what he said to me next made me just cry and die. And he had to have been there. But it was just, he said, there is a place for you in my kingdom. And I was just, I had been talking to someone about that, you know, and to use those words fit so perfectly. There was no way anyone else knew those words or knew to say it that way. And it just wiped out every defense I had. I was, no one could know. No one knew. It was Jesus. And yeah, I heard him. <laughs> and I thought everyone else did too. I mean, I kept it to myself, but, you know, um, I shared it, well, immediately when it happened, I shared it with the person that was, you know, there at the time, and they remember, you know, they were like in tears, crying and bawling, you know, amazed, but when I left that day, you know, and later I just assumed that everyone else had heard Jesus speak, you know, audibly. I thought everyone else did this, and I still to this day think a lot of people do, and they, you know, they try to tell you, but you don't listen. But you should pursue on. You should grow in the knowledge of God and of His Son, because that is what eternal life is. That is the knowledge of Jesus and the Father, of growing in the knowledge of them. And if you don't, you're missing out. I mean, I don't know how to say it any bluntler than that, but you're just not doing everything God wants you to do. It's not about going out and doing something. Sometimes it's about getting to know who you're supposed to know. Why can't I not follow you now? Or why can't I not, yeah, why can't I not follow you now? Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I not follow you now? There are times when you can't understand why you cannot do what you want to do. In this, doing this, you know, there's lots of times being a disciple of Jesus that you're going to run into contradictions of what you think you should do, what you want to do, and then what God tells you to do. Because this is about the utmost. This isn't about playing around or you know trying to debate about whether or not God exists or whether God can speak to you or whether God will intervene or whether he'll open up the heavens. He will. He'll do all these things. But you got to do what you're supposed to do. So part of this hard-hitting impact is the fact that you need one of these because that's what we're using for discipleship. It is called my utmost for his highest. I don't care if you use it in the today's English or you use it in the original version or whatever version you use. Read it. But take it literal and take it impactful because Chambers was meaning what he said. It is something that you cannot live up to but you will be challenged to and it will change you and rearrange you and I have asked God to speak that he would speak to you through it in some way that eventually by the time you've gone through it completely that you would hear his voice. So it wouldn't be just me wandering around, you know, people thinking I'm nuts hearing voice in my head because it was audible. I mean, it wasn't like in my head, sorry. I mean, there are times where, yeah, he speaks still small voice inside me, but that's just normal stuff, you know, or he speaks in those word or circumstances or all the situations. But there's more to it than that. It's a relationship. It grows and develops as you grow and develop in your relationship with people around you. So. In growing and developing as a disciple, there will be times when you can't understand why you cannot do what you want to do in your relationship with Jesus. There are times he doesn't want you to do something even though you want to. When God brings a time of waiting and appears to be unresponsive, don't fill it with busyness, but just wait. There are times when God's not going to say, I want you to wait, but he's going to bring about the circumstances that cause you to wait. Waiting on him means that the timing isn't right or the circumstances are right, or you're not right, or the people are right. He's got to move everything into place so that when it's right, you're ready. So don't be surprised if he stops you in your tracks at some point in time and you go <laughs> and somebody says, well, so we gonna do that today? And you go, mm, no, I don't think the Lord wants me to do that. And you go, what? Well, the Lord told me, wait, wait, what do you mean wait? We got to do it now. No, I don't, <laughs> frankly. Uh, until God says, go, I'm waiting. 
The time of waiting may come to teach you the meaning of sanctification, to be set apart from sin and made holy, or it may come after the process of sanctification has begun to teach you what service means. Never run before God gives you his direction. Always in everything, we are told that if we would trust in the Lord with all our heart, if we would lean not in our own understanding, if we would in all our ways acknowledge him, then he would direct our path, not we would direct our path. It's not a path of, oh, well, I just get to make up my choices and decisions, but it's an everyday moment by moment experience of God directing your path. So you seek him, you talk to him, you get to know him, and then you know when he says, wait, you wait. When he says go, you go. When he says turn right, you turn right. When he says turn left, you turn left. When he says step back, you step back. You don't just go out and do what you think you ought to do because you want to do it. Don't work that way. It's like today I've been waiting to record this because God said wait. I had to live it. So then finally, out of some point in time, God said, record it. And that was after reading some things. <laughs> I went, you got to be kidding me. Never run before God gives you his direction. If you have the slightest doubt, then he is not guiding. You must be confident of the direction you go. Whenever there is doubt, wait. At first you may see clearly what God's will is the severance of a friendship, the breaking off of a business relationship, or something else you feel is distinctly God's will for you to do. But, never act on the impulse of that feeling. Never know, just because God says do something doesn't mean you know when to do it. It's kind of like my wife and I, you know, we're moving. We know that. We're going to move. That's for sure. When? We don't know. But we're going to move. There's no doubt. The circumstances are all obvious to us, you know. There's just too many things that don't work, that are contradictory, that seem to be conflict, you know. And rather than get involved in the conflict, you just step back and pray. And when it's God's timing, he'll say go. And in the moment he says go, we up and go that day. We don't have a problem. It's that easy for me. But for other people, I know they're challenged by that, that sometimes they don't know to wait. And so that's what we're learning on this step of discipleship, of applying why you can't do what you want to do, when you want to do it, as you want to do it, because God wants you to sometimes wait till he says to do it. So just because you know what to do doesn't mean you know when to do it. But never act on the impulse of that feeling, because if you do, you will cause difficult situations to arise which will take years to untangle. Wait for God's timing, and he will do it without any heartache or disappointment. When it is a question of the providential will of God, wait for God to move. He will provide the answer. Peter did not wait for God. He predicted in his own mind where the test would come, and it came where he did not expect it. Oh, I will lay down my life for you. Peter's statement was honest, but ignorant. Jesus answered him, The rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. This was said with a deeper knowledge of Peter than Peter had of himself. He could not know Jesus because he did not know himself or his own capabilities well enough. Natural devotion to God may be enough to attract us to Jesus and to make us feel his irresistible charm, but it will never make us his disciples. To be his disciples, we have to find within ourselves that in us there dwells no good thing, that we are totally dependent upon him. Natural devotion will deny Jesus, always falling short of what it means to truly follow him. In order to follow him, you have to obey him. In order to obey him, you have to know what he says. In order to know what he says, you have to hear him. In order to hear him, you have to ask him. And in order to ask him, you have to seek him. In order to seek him, you have to find him. And then you have to know him in a personal, intimate way. So if you're not, then you're not his disciple. Stop what you're doing. Spend the quality time to get to know him until he says, go forward or do what he wants you to do, not what you want to do. You may want to dive into ministry. If he says do, go for it. If he says wait, wait on it. If he says do it and I'll teach you, then you learn as you go. But the basic premise behind any disciple is, did Jesus tell you to do it? I ask everyone on the internet regularly and any place else that you know, I find these contradictions in terms when people seem to contradict their words from their actions. 
I simply say to them, you know, listen to what they have to say, and they always have these long-winded explanations, always excuses. And I ask directly, well, did you talk to Jesus? They say, well, yeah, I talked to Jesus. Okay, then what did he tell you to do? And they never have the answer for that one. Because it's easier to make up a religious answer than it is to be responsible for a relationship answer. Because you see, if you have a personal relationship, then you're responsible for the maintaining of that relationship. But if you have a religious answer, then you can always compromise the issue by saying different opposing opinions of what you think fits, as opposed to what is true and accurate in a relationship. That's why Jesus was personal to the person. He wasn't about some generalizations that you can do in religion, but he was individually applying by his Holy Spirit the circumstances and the scripture that fit that person to that moment in that day. Because the reality of a disciple is that they know their Lord. They walk with Jesus and they talk with him every day. They spend that quality time to have a personal relationship as opposed to just a religion. Anyone can be religious, but not everyone has a personal relationship with Jesus.